Golden Eagles Come Home One winter day, early in the year 21 B.C., Augustus, munching with relish a small sour apple and carrying in his left hand a letter from the king of Parthia, climbed to the small study at the top of his house, which was his favorite retreat. There he could consider this annoying matter of Parthia without interruption. It was high time, Augustus thought, for Rome to settle accounts with that irritating and still undefeated rival. At the winter capital of Parthia, on the Tigris River, there were still Roman standards, golden eagles of Rome, which had been there on display for thirty years. In all those thirty years, to Rome's shame and humiliation, no general had been able to recapture them. Julius Caesar had been killed before his campaign against Parthia could be carried out. Antony's attempt had met with defeat. Now, the king of Parthia, it seemed, did not intend to fulfill his latest agreement. Augustus reread his evasive letter. Nine years ago, on his return from Egypt as master of the Roman world, Augustus had brought home with him a young son of the Parthian king as a pledge of his father's good intentions. He had kept the boy in Rome for six years and then sent him back to Parthia on condition that the king, his father, would send back the Roman standards. The handsome young Oriental prince had long since arrived in Parthia, but the golden eagles had not yet appeared in Rome. Instead, Augustus had received this letter in which the king suggested that ransom be paid for the return of the Roman prisoners who also were held captive in Parthia. Augustus shoved the letter aside and scraped his small teeth thoughtfully along the core of his apple. Most people in Rome, he knew, expected him to take up the unfinished work of Caesar and Antony, undertake a campaign, annihilate Parthia, and push on the boundary of the Roman Empire to the border of India. But he himself had no such idea. He was a statesman, not a warrior. He preferred to accomplish his purpose by peaceful means, if it were possible. In this case, Armenia, he believed, might prove the key to the situation. He drew toward him and bent over a map of that eastern part of the Roman world, sent him by one of the traveling geographers. There was Armenia, like Syria, lying on the border between the empires of Rome and Parthia. Herod, whose kingdom included much of Syria, and whose two sons by Mariamne were now also living in Rome, would remain a loyal subject. Augustus was sure of that. But the king of Armenia was a slippery fellow, very likely to switch his allegiance to Parthia, if it seemed to his advantage. Fortunately, he had been such a bad king that the Armenians themselves were dissatisfied, and they wanted a change of rulers. A brother of the king had been living in exile in Rome. The thing to do, Augustus decided, was to march into Armenia with an army and crown this brother king. That would show Parthia and any other possible friends of Parthia that Rome meant business and that a promise made to Rome had better be kept. He would go east himself, Augustus thought, and take Tiberius. Tiberius could lead the army into Armenia while he stayed on the island of Samos and directed operations from there. Tiberius was now 21, level-headed, and quite capable of managing the whole affair, and it would please Livia, who would also go with them. Then, with the thought of leaving Rome, it suddenly occurred to Augustus that there was no Agrippa now to leave in charge while he was gone. How he needed Agrippa! Rolling up the map, he reached for his pen and ink, 
carefully adjusted a piece of horn which acted as a brace to his limp forefinger and wrote to Agrippa, asking him to return from the east at once as soon as possible. That night, seated on the edge of his bed, with his right shoe taken off first for good luck, what he considered to be a very bright idea struck him. It concerned Agrippa and his daughter Julia, who was fast becoming much too merry a young widow. Upon his return to Rome, Agrippa must divorce his wife and marry Julia. So Julia, at nineteen, became the wife of Agrippa, who was then forty-two, old enough to be her father. Augustus was highly pleased and hoped upon his return from the east to find a baby grandson, another heir of his own flesh and blood, to fill the vacant place left by Marcellus. The trip to the east was a major success. All plans worked out, and not a drop of blood was shed. In Armenia, Tiberius found that the bad king had been conveniently murdered by his own relatives so all he had to do was crown the new king and seat him on the vacant throne. The Parthian king, properly alarmed by such speedy action in Armenia, hastened to fulfill his bargain with Rome. Tiberius went to Syria to receive the standards as well as the prisoners, who were all allowed to return home without ransom. The winter spent on the island of Samos was most enjoyable. Envoys from all the neighboring kings came to pay respect to the emperor of Rome. Even from faraway India came one delegation with friendly greetings to this powerful ruler of the West and bringing curious gifts, among them a tiger, an animal unknown to the Romans. In the summer of 19 BC, the imperial family were on their journey home. Stopping in Athens on the way, they found Virgil, still working on his poem. Since he was not feeling well, Augustus urged him to return with them to Rome. The poet only reached Brundisium. There, on September 22nd, Virgil died, after making a request which was not to be granted. His request was that the Aeneid, on which he spent eleven years, should be destroyed and never published. The carrying of the standards into Rome was the signal for great rejoicing. They were placed in the temple of Mars the Avenger. Rome's shame and disgrace were now wiped out. The golden eagles had returned from Parthia. Augustus also, to his great joy, saw his first grandson who, as he hoped, had been born in his absence. This baby boy, the first son of Julia and Agrippa, was named Gaius.